Dr. Dennis Bielfeld from the Christ School of Theology. You're watching a series of lectures here on Descartes as part of a class called Faith, Knowledge, and Reason, dealing with the philosophical presuppositions of the uh, study of theology, actually, and particularly the theological tradition uh, over uh, the last couple centuries, have, has been influenced uh, certainly by Descartes, and we're talking about Descartes today. Okay, I talked about the uh, first argument for the existence of God in Descartes. Of course, this was the argument that started with uh, the idea of perfection. The cause must have at as least as much reality as the effect, so the idea of perfection must be caused by something with at least that much reality. Another idea wouldn't do it, according to Descartes. It has to be an absolutely perfect being that exists extra mente, outside of the mind, outside of uh, me. And this uh, God, which is a perfect being, then uh, is the cause of the idea of, of perfection in me. But he has another argument for the existence of God. Let's, it goes like this. I exist. Okay, we've determined cogito ergo sum, so I exist. Well, my existence must have a cause. And then he points out, well, here are the candidates. Uh, I could cause myself, right? That could be uh, possible. One, I could cause myself, poof, myself, there it goes. Myself is the cause, right? Uh, I could have always existed. These are the various possibilities, he thinks. Uh, I uh, am caused by my parents. Well, of course I am, but is that the ultimate cause of me, right? Uh, something less than God. I'm caused by something less than God. Or the final one would be I'm caused by God. Now you can pretty much figure out how this goes. Uh, he says, well, it can't be A, right? Because if I had uh, created myself, uh, I would have had to make myself perfect, but I couldn't have made myself perfect, therefore I cannot be the cause of myself because, of course, uh, I have a, an idea in me of perfection, uh, so I could not have been the cause of me existing with the idea of perfection in myself. Uh, nor does B solve the problem uh, because this, if I am a dependent being, I need to be continually sustained by another. I am a dependent being, so it can't be the fact that uh, we could just say I've always existed. This leads to an infinite regress, so that's no, that's not going to work. Uh, the idea, me, with the idea of perfection in me, cannot come from uh, a non-perfect being, right? Because I have the idea of perfection in me. So the only candidate is God. God exists, right? So in the same way that the cogito is self-evident, so too is the existence of God as his perfect idea of a perfect being could not have been caused by anything less than a perfect being. So that's how that works. Now, you may not be absolutely convinced of that, but uh, join the club with many people. Everything depends upon this idea of perfection. Well, do we have one? And if we do have one, uh, could it be caused by something other than, finally, a perfect being? So you can see that last argument is connected to the first. Okay, what do we have in Descartes? What's the big picture? Well, we have three uh, substances. God, right, whose essence is perfection. And God can exist on his own. But in his ongoing act uh, of preservation or concurrence, is the word that's used, God keeps in being, right, matter and mind. So we have God, whose essence is perfection. We have matter, whose essence, essence can't talk, is extension. Now, what is extension? Well, it comes in many other properties, are uh, extended properties, size, shape, position, motion, length, breadth, and depth. All of these things uh, are extension. And, of course, 
Our friend Descartes uh, is not an ancient atomist because, of course, Democrates and his school held that uh, matter fell through a void so that there was a void. Actually, Descartes seems to consider space to be a type of matter because it's, it's extended, right? <laughs> okay, and the essence of mind is thinking, uh, which includes intellect and will. So if we want to talk just a bit about the mind, the mind uh, divides between intellect and will. Okay, this is the race cogatons, thinking thing. Uh, the, the thinking thing divides between intellectual acts of thinking and willing acts of thinking. And he divides now the intellect into imagination and sense perception. That's how that works. Uh, and uh, the in imagination and the sense perception, of course, they're dependent upon the notion of a body. And over here in the will, I mean, there are different kinds of willings. There's desire, aversion, assertion, denial, doubt. There are all kinds of different uh, willings, if you will. And what he uh, claims is that we have a purely intellectual uh, apprehension, right, of the substance uh, of matter and mind. He claims uh, that the purity of the intellect that has this intellectual grasp is independent of body. Right? Now, if you ever get lost with Descartes, uh, remember that Descartes believes that a disembodied existence is possible, right? So the mind can exist apart from a body. It doesn't uh, in this life, but it is metaphysically possible for it to do so, and indeed upon death it does so. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned before, the will seems to be uh, in some sense dependent upon the intellect, and here you see uh, the idea of the intellect is primary because uh, when the intellect forms a judgment, the will is going to follow it. But there's this voluntarist side of Descartes too uh, because the will is always free. It's free to choose one thing over the other thing. So while it, it follows the intellect, it follows it because the intellect forms judgments that are, uh, for the most part, right, although not always. Because sometimes the will forms a judgment uh, that is provisional. The, or the, did I say the will? The intellect forms a judgment that's provisional, but the will is going to follow it and take a hold of it like uh, it's certain. And this is where error arrives, arises for Descartes. When the will uh, holds to positions uh, on the basis of less than perfect uh, evidence. Right? Okay, Meditation 4, a nice quote. If I suspend judgment, when I don't clearly and distinctly grasp what is true, I obviously do right and I am not deceived. But if I either affirm or deny in a case of this sort, of this sort I misuse my freedom of choice. If I affirm what is false, I clearly err, and if I stumble onto the truth, I am still blameworthy since the light of nature reveals that a perception of the understanding should always precede a division or a decision of the will. In these misuses of freedom of choice lies the deprivation that accounts for error. And this deprivation, I maintain, lies in the working of the will insofar as it comes from me, not in my God-given ability to will or even in the will's operation insofar as it derives from him. I'm created in God's image. I have freedom of the will like God does. 
My problem is that I start believing things without sufficient evidence. Now, uh, we would say that Descartes is an internalist here uh, with respect to setting up uh, epistemic criteria of having uh, certain obligations, epistemic obligations, and duty doing uh, so that one does not make a mistake. I share God's freedom of the will, but I am limited uh, epistemically. God knows all things. His will is free. I know some things. My will is free, and that was, that's what gets me in trouble. I'm Dr. Dennis Bielfeld of the Christ School of Theology. I'll be right back.